Welcome to By Faith with Susie and Mike. This program is about regular people who've activated their faith and have done great things for the kingdom of God. When we move, God moves with us. What is God calling you to do today? By faith, obey his voice and enjoy the ride as he does things you could never imagine. Now here's your hosts, Susie and Mike. Welcome to By Faith with Susie and Mike. We have a special one today. You know, not all shows are created equal, Susie. <laughs> and true. today's show is a special one. Tell us about our guest. We have an incredible special guest. And this guest, we have the same one thing in common. And guess what that is? We didn't like the homeless <laughs> in the beginning until God changed our hearts. So you're gonna hear an amazing story today about how God changed the heart of this amazing hero of ours, Ron Hall. Well, welcome, welcome Ron. Ron. Thank you. Where do we start with you, by the way? New York Times, best-selling book, um, and then a movie made after you. Greg Kinnear actually played you, Ron, and all these things. But here's the thing. I want to go right to the heart of what we're talking about today. Did you always have a heart for the homeless? Is that something that you always, when you were younger, <laughs> did you have a heart for the homeless? Actually, that's comical. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like 99% of all other people in the world. We wanted them all to become invisible and somebody else to take care of them. And I was certainly among those. And uh, no, I did not have a heart for the homeless, but, but God took care of that. Yes. <laughs> Well, tell us about your late wife, Debbie, and how a dream of hers forever changed your life. Well, my late wife, Debbie, was a God chaser. You know, she read a book one time, and it was called The God Chaser, and she learned how to chase after the heart of God and to, uh, and to see, look for the face of Jesus in every situation. And so uh, after she read this book, she became deeply spiritual. She began looking for God in places where other people are not looking for him. And that happened to be in the face of homeless people and the face of the poor and the, and the people of different races and colors and creeds and everything. Um, she became um, a, a teacher of, of various religions to people that didn't uh, really know what they believed, but ultimately would bring them back around to Christianity and why she believed that. But um, one time, about, well, this is 1998. Can you believe 22 years ago? Oh. How long were you guys married at this point? We'd been married uh, 28 years at okay. that time. Mm -hmm. And she had a literal dream about a homeless man who would change our lives and our city. And the next morning she woke me up and she said, Ron, it was like a verse from Ecclesiastes 9.15 where Solomon wrote, there was found in the city a certain poor man who was wise. And by his wisdom, our city was changed. And she said, I believe if we can find this homeless man who I saw his face in my dream. And if we can go on the streets of Fort Worth and find this homeless man, I know that our lives will be changed as well. So that's how we got started looking for this homeless man of her dreams. So, so, so <laughs> she believed that she had a dream from God. Mm -hmm. So the, the night that she told you this, did you believe that? What was your initial thought? Well, my, my, my initial thought was I was wishing she hadn't dreamed that, but <laughs> <laughs> because there was no backing down for this woman. She was like a Susie Jennings, you know, <laughs> so she uh, she knew that she had heard from God, or at least she believed that she had uh, heard from God. But she had heard from God before and had to check things out on her own without my help. And as it turned out, she had heard from God. She had had uh, another literal dream, very, very literal dream that uh, was proven to be from God uh, about after, three years after she had it. And, but she never gave up on the dream for the three years until all of a sudden the proof was right there in front of her. So I didn't question her because she was an extremely intelligent person and she was not one that would ever deceive anyone into believing anything. So uh, she was only about the truth. Well, tell us about your first encounter with this homeless man called Denver Moore. Well, this first uh, encounter with him was actually before I knew his name was Denver Moore. He was only known as suicide on the streets <laughs> yeah. because nobody messed with him. He had been on the streets for more than 25 years. Um, but that first morning after her dream, she asked me to go with her into the inner city of Fort Worth to search for this man of her dream. And, and we didn't find him. We spent most of the day driving around where all the homeless people hang out. 
And uh, so that afternoon, as we were going to be leaving there, she said, hey, let's stop. There's a homeless shelter here. Let's stop and maybe uh, see if we can serve an evening meal. Maybe he'll come through the line and we will we'll see him there. So we did. We stopped and uh, began serving an evening meal at uh, the Tarrant County Union Gospel Mission. And we'd been there a couple of weeks serving an e evening meal when all of a sudden uh, the men were coming out of a chapel service, but in a side door, not from the chapel service, in stormed this giant looking man with no shoes and no shirt, <laughs> how just tall, some raggedy unzip britches. Yeah. How tall was Denver? Oh, I don't know. He looked to be about like Godzilla. He was about eight <laughs> feet tall, toothless and all that. But in reality, he was only six feet tall. But uh, he was a very large man, very unkept with the very large hair that was standing out. And he, he looked extremely. He was angry. He was screaming at the top of his lungs. I'm going to kill whoever done it. I'm going to kill whoever stole my shoes. And he began overturning tables in the dining hall and hitting anybody within reach. And so that's my first day that I laid eyes on Denver Moore. And I actually thought he might kill me because I was in the room. He said, I'm going to kill everybody until I find out who did it. So, yeah. So, so let's go back to that moment. He comes in with a bat, right? We see in the movie, he comes in and he's crashing the place up. And now your wife is telling you, that's the guy in my dream. What's running <laughs> through your mind? Well, uh, honey, I, I, well, what she told me is that that's the man in my dream. But I, I said, uh, and she said, and I believe I heard from God that you have to be his friend. I said, but honey, I was not at that meeting you had with God. And if I'm going to be friends with someone who wants to kill everybody, I need to go talk to God myself. Mm. And so that night I did have a little talk with God. And, and even though I didn't hear his voice, because I didn't really believe in that time of hearing audible voices from God, I've changed my mind about that <laughs> after my friendship with him. But um, I didn't believe at the time, but I do know that God spoke to me and said that being friends with a homeless man is a small price to pay for the forgiveness that I have shown you and, and I believe uh, in, the, in, the, in forgiveness that Debbie has shown you as well. Mm. So um, I said, okay, God. So at God insistence and Debbie's insistence, I began a pursuit of a friendship with this man that took me five months. So. Well, they thought um, Denver was crazy, but actually oh. he was very wise. So could you tell us any example? Well, his, everyone thought he was the craziest, most dangerous homeless man on the street. Some people called him the lion of the jungle because you didn't well, mess with him. Mm. Yeah. Other people just knew him as suicide because, mm -hmm. you know, just... Um, even an, any encounter with him would be the equivalent of committing suicide because no one knew his real name and no one would talk to him because they were all afraid of him. But uh, the first day that it took me five months to get him in my car. And, um, and so after we had breakfast, we kind of got to know each other. I uh, decided the next morning I would go sit on the curb with him and just get to know him a little better. So I sat on the dumpster. He lived by a dumpster in the inner city right across from the gospel mission. So it's the first morning we're sitting there and uh, I asked him, I said, what's it like to be homeless? And he said, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? And I said, well, I've never been homeless. In fact, I live in a nice home. And he said, well, let me tell you something, Mr. Ron. <laughs> whether we is rich or whether we is poor or something in between, this earth ain't no final resting place. He said, so in a way, we're all homeless, just working our way back home. That's true. Wow, that is true. And then he looked at me and he said, are you one of them Christians? And I said, yeah, why do you think I'm trying to help? And he said, trying to help? You ain't helping nobody but yourself because you probably ain't done nothing for nobody but yourself in a long time. You're just here to make yourself feel better. You ain't trying to help nobody. You think giving a dollar bill to somebody or putting spaghetti on a plate is helping? No. He said, you want to help somebody? You got to crawl down in the ditch with them. And when they're strong enough to crawl out on your back, then you helped them. But other than that, you're blessing us. And we appreciate your blessing, but you ain't helping nobody but yourself. And he said, but that ain't what I want to talk to you about, you Christians. He said, I want to know why is it all you Christians worship one homeless man on Sunday and turn your back on the first one you see on Monday? Mm. He said, Mr. Ron, you never know whose eyes God is watching you out of. And it ain't going to be your preacher or your Sunday school teacher. He said, it might be a fellow that looks like me. Now, it ain't me, he said, but it might be a fellow that looks like me. God's checking you out to see what kind of person you really are. 
So God was clearly speaking through Denver <laughs> to teach all of us and to teach you a lesson. Obviously, he was going to teach the world through your story, which is pretty amazing. But you said that Denver actually saw things for, in the spirit. He did. T talk a little bit about that. Well, Denver had never been to school a day in his life. He could not read a word of anything. He didn't watch television. He didn't know a sports team. In fact, I was asking him one time, uh, when we actually began writing our book, I was asking him uh, some things, just basic questions. I mean, who was your favorite president of the United States? And he said, I only know one. And I said, who was that? And he said, Abraham Lincoln. And I said, okay. He said, wasn't there another one? He said, I think there was another president too. And I said, what are you talking? He said, well, didn't one get shot in Dallas? And I said, yeah. He said, I knew about him too. So he didn't, he couldn't tell you the name of a sports team or anything else. He was a spiritual being that just talked and listened and he lived in silence with mm. even all the confusion around him of being homeless for 25 years after being in prison for years. So, but he just was a spiritual being. And so he only listened to spiritual things that mm. could come into his yeah, mind to keep the confusion of being on the streets at, a, at bay. So. After uh, Debbie died, uh, you became very close to Denver and actually uh, you lived together and lived life together. So right. how was that? Well, I, I asked him to move in with me and, um, and he did. And he moved in with me and my children at first. And then my children both got married and moved away. So it was just Denver and me for more than 10 years as roommates and best friends. <laughs> and uh, well, you know, it was a very learning experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but to take a, a, a schizophrenic, psychotic, uh, bipolar, <laughs> addict, uh, a killer, ex-con into your home that doesn't read or write and has no sense of, of, uh, of any kind of responsibility or accountability and teach him to obey and to be on time. He used to tell me, he said, Mr. Ron, I done lived my whole life with no place to go and plenty of time to get there. Now you tell me I got to be on time. I don't know what time is. So it's a challenge when you move someone like that in your home. But it was the greatest blessing that I've ever had in my life. So during this 10 year period, when you lived together, which is incredible, your wife had passed and you were in this season, you and Denver were getting closer and a relationship was being built. Actually, that's when the book was written, same kind of different as me, it's sold over 2 million copies. It's incredible, Ron, during that season, when you guys were developing this relationship, what, was, what did you learn about yourself through this man, Denver? Well, I... <laughs> What did I learn about myself? I learned that I was a very selfish person, that I was totally self-centered, that it was all about me and what I wanted and when I wanted it. And uh, I learned that I was a very judgmental person. I stood in judgment of almost everyone in every situation. And uh, Denver taught me that one day I was walking the streets with him and I had stood in judgment. I, I judged a man that I thought was drunk on the streets. And, and Denver, uh, as we stepped away from that, Denver told me, he said, Mr. Ron, that man doesn't drink and he doesn't do drugs or anything else. He said, he moved here from Mexico to get a job as a bricklayer and a rock man to take care of his family, a big family back in Mexico. So he lives on the streets to uh, take care of us uh, so he can send all of his money home. He eats his meals at the mission, so he has to spend no money on food and no money on rent. And all of the money goes back to take care of a large family. And you judged a man thinking he was drunk or a drug addict without knowing the man's heart. And he said, look down at the end of the street and what do you see there? And we were standing about two blocks from the courthouse and it was standing in the middle of the street. And I said, I see the courthouse. He said, you sure do. And let me tell you something, Mr. Ron, that courthouse is full of judges and God ain't looking for no more of them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you won't come down on the streets with me, you come as a servant, leave your judge's robe hanging in your closet. Wow. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well then, Susie Jennings, while you're writing this book, same kind of different as me, you're developing this relationship. God is turning your world really upside down. When you think about an art dealer, your wife passes, you go through a season that many people, like all of us actually here, go through a season. You know, I call it the fellowship of the broken. Um, 
when you're in that season of being broken, Susie Jennings, another person who has been broken, um, shows up at your door. Here she is doing this huge event at the Dallas Convention Center. She comes to the door of Denver Moore and Ron Hall. You never knew her before. This is no. fascinating. <laughs> Knocks on your door. What did you think when, she, when Susie Jennings <laughs> showed up at your door? Well, she actually <laughs> found my number and called me and she said, <laughs> I read your book. You Ron Hall? Yes. And Denver Moore? Yes. I read your book. I've got to come talk to you. You love the homeless. I love the homeless. We have to do things together. Do you know about me? I said, no, I don't know about you. Okay, I do a Christmas party for the homeless, and you're going to come. In fact, you're going to speak at our uh, event coming up. We're going to have a fundraiser for the homeless, and you and Denver are going to speak at that. And I said, oh, okay, we are. Let me look at my calendar. No, no, no. We, we do. We work with your schedule. What that? We're going to be there. So <laughs> how do you say no to Susie Jennings? You can't. So, you can't. That was in, uh, so. I don't know, that was uh, 12 years ago or something. I don't know a long time ago. Right. It was, uh, yeah, that's true. It's 12 years ago. It was 2008. You okay. were the first um, okay. gala speaker okay. of Operation Care. That was our first gala 2008. And I remember that day and I, I wept when Denver started talking. There's something about Denver that just touched my heart greatly, just in the presence of Denver. I, I, I don't know, but it was, I just wept. I cried. I cried. I mean, it was very meaningful. And so they became, uh, they were the first uh, speaker. Uh, both of them were the first speakers. And so how does Operation Care touch your heart? Oh, my gosh. You know, I have been in probably 400 homeless shelters across America, and I have seen people lined up for their evening meal just to get something put on a plate. And but to show up at Operation Care and see thousands of people that are homeless are chronically, severely living in poverty to see them with such joy in their eyes, knowing that once they get inside the building, they're going to get their feet washed. They're going to get new shoes. Mm -hmm. The kids are going to get bicycles. They're going to get presents. They're going to get new coats. They're going to get health care. This is the most beautiful <laughs> event I've ever seen in the whole world. And um, I mean, it's just so meaningful to see lives being transformed in the love, B seeing thousands of volunteers being the hands and feet of Christ for a day to those, to the, the least of these, as we call them. But, you know, in the way they're God's people, just like Denver used to tell me, he said, Mr. Ron, all you people want us to become invisible. But let me tell you how God sees us. Mm -hmm. God sees us not as invisible, but he sees us as an opportunity for the faithful to show the love of Christ. You know, speaking of that, the trademark of what Susie has done has been foot washing. Yes. And when you get on your knees, really, truly, yes. and wash the feet of a homeless person, I know that touched <clears throat> you. Uh, you've been coming back. Actually, you come as a volunteer, yeah. you buy coach, you bring yeah. them, you're a cheerleader, you're a big uh, part of Operation Care International, and we thank you for that. But I want to talk about when you walk in that room, because it hit me too. When you see volunteers washing the feet of the homeless, the power of foot washing. Yes. Well, you know, I learned about that, not only from the Bible, but I learned it from Debbie. She was the first person I ever saw wash the feet of the homeless and at the mission where we were in Fort Worth she did once a week she would do a foot washing and give manicures to all the homeless women and uh, it was such a beautiful thing the women would just sit and weep because all of a sudden it made them feel of value it made them feel the love of Christ because while Debbie wasn't preaching to them she was just demonstrating the love of Christ until she had earned the right to be heard through doing things like foot washing, then she never even spoke the words of Jesus, but they knew exactly where this was coming from. And it's life changing uh, mm. for, for those, not only that are washing the feet, you know, we go there thinking we're doing something for these people, but really we're the ones that's receiving the blessing. Well, you were saying this wasn't the plan for your life, uh, oh, but it's my. really God's plan. <laughs> it uh, but it's really God's plan. plan. <laughs> so explain what that means. Well, the plan for my life was to retire on a boat somewhere, a <laughs> sailboat or something, yeah. and just live my life as a, just as a selfish person doing what I wanted to do for my life. But uh, God knew what I needed in my life. He knew that I needed a, a real big dose of humble pie 
and, uh, you know, moving and, and becoming a person that's on the streets with homeless people all the time is a very humbling experience. And um, after I enrolled in what I called the University of Denver, and I used to go to the streets <laughs> every day. I like that. Yeah. I used to go to the streets every day and sit with Denver and other homeless people and just, I wasn't trying to teach them anything. I was learning from them. And this is what I, uh, if, from our book, Same Kind of Different as Me, and in my new book, what, uh, Working Our Way Home, I just share the wisdom uh, that comes straight from the mouth of Denver and the other homeless people that is so brilliant. You know, when you, when you take time to uh, and invest just a few minutes of time into the lives of a homeless person, you learn so much because, you know, they are, they're beautiful people and, 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 and they may not look so beautiful on the outside, but they have the heart that we all have the same thing, same beating heart. And I, I just love being with them. Uh, you know, you were discussing uh, during our, our event regarding Operation Care right. event, and that's actually our Christmas event every year that we do uh, a Saturday before Christmas where we gather right. uh, the homeless. And uh, actually that came from a Bible, where in, in the Bible it said, call the lame and the poor, I will have a big party and the rich will not come, so get the poor. So that's where we got this story. We're in, we'll have a big birthday party for Jesus. We're in the guest of honor will be the homeless and the poor. And then we're going to um, provide for their spiritual and physical needs. And spiritual is sharing the gospel. That's what we do. It's a must. And of course, the physical is putting on shoes and also washing feet. But washing feet is also a servanthood. Could you imagine washing the dirtiest and the smelliest, stinkiest feet in the world? And that's the homeless feet. And that's your sin and my sin. And Jesus is still going to wash it. But that's what we love to do every Christmas time to emulate the character of Christ. Because it's his birthday we are celebrating. And actually it's going to happen very soon, December 19. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you know what Susie said there about uh, washing the feet. You know, Jesus, you know, we are not perfect people, Christians. We are forgiven people. And when you hear a story like this, we're, we're, we are all selfish and we all went astray. But, you know, it's God's love that comes and his, his kindness that leads us to repentance. And, you know, I know Denver recently passed, Ron. Um, uh, tell us about um, what is it like that, that Denver is no longer here? And you're still talking about this, this 10-year this period. You're still writing books. A movie takes place. What is it like to look back on that time now? Well, uh, for many of you know that I, I spent a lot of years of my life as a cowboy. So I tell a lot of people that knew me as a cowboy, uh, when they ask me what it's like to miss Denver, I said, it's like uh, a one-legged cowboy misses a pair of boots. Mm -hmm. It's just not the same. same. You, every day you wake up and if you're only putting on one boot, and for almost 14 years that Denver and I were best friends, I had two boots to put on every day. And then all of a sudden you just have one. But not hardly an hour passes in my life where I don't think back to uh, and think back on the wisdom that I use that uh, that he that he gave me. Uh, he told me uh, one time when uh, he said, people think that we're preachers because we everybody wants us to come to the church. But he said, let's let everybody know that we ain't nothing. But I'm an old ex con and you're just an old art dealer. But he said, we're both sinners saved by grace. Yeah. But we got a message of hope for those that ain't got none. And um, and so we just use that. But I just I look back on that. I mean, there's some the little something tiny will go wrong in a day. And I think back that Denver used to tell me almost every day when something like that would happen. He said, Mr. Ron, you know, if the devil ain't messing with you, he's already got you. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's just I, there's, I can't get away yeah. from the voice that plays inside of my head uh, hours a day from Denver. So um, he's still with me mm -hmm. because I write about him and speak about him. And I love to go back on the YouTube and watch him singing and talking on YouTube. When you look, yes. look Denver Moore on YouTube, it's a beautiful thing. So, How did he learn how to even uh, play the piano and, and, and paint and all that? That was an amazing thing. God, it's why really did you incredible. ask that? You should know that. 
Yeah. I know. It's, it's just, I was just so amazed. So the, nothing is impossible. That's right. With well, God, he was a you know? homeless man. Yes, that uh, when he moved in with me, he didn't read, yes. didn't write, hmm. he didn't paint, he didn't do anything except drink uh, my wine collection that I would have stopped <laughs> drinking at the time. But he found my <laughs> wine collection and was able to totally clear that out in no time almost. So, Ron, what, were, what did your neighbors, friends, your circle of <laughs> friends, when, when he, those first few months or a year or two that he first moved in and here you are, he's living with you, you guys are together. Was that, what did people, how did, socially, how did that play out? <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you see our movie, you know, uh, when I started taking it to our country club, that didn't yeah, work out right. too well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, other events like that. But, you know, people began to see that uh, it was a beautiful thing. It was a real friendship. It was a beautiful friend. We were closer than brothers. And uh, it was uh, so people then began to really enjoy him because he didn't really speak to anyone. But if you sat down and would, you know, give him a minute or two, he would give you some very uh, clear spiritual message that he believed that you needed to hear. So people were always wondering what's he had to say today, you know. So. You know, we're running out of time, Susie, and I want to go into something that you both can speak into. And here's what it is. We want to talk about how you, when God called you, you were driving underneath the bridge in downtown Dallas. And God said, I want you to start bringing blankets. And it led to your ministry today. And Ron, who had another plan for his life, sailing, golfing, enjoying his wealth. And God had another plan. Now that you guys both can reflect on how God has used you so powerfully uh, and how he's uh, given you uh, something much greater than anything that wealth or the world could give you, what would be your advice for somebody right now that's watching who is being sort of tugged to do something that some other people might say, that's crazy? Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> well, people always say the, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Mm -hmm. But the first step really is if you see a homeless person on the street, roll down your window, ask him his name, ask him, what can I pray for you today? And then hopefully maybe I'll come back tomorrow and have something to bless you with. You may not always be ready to bless somebody, but you know, you can bless them just by asking their name and humanizing them. Right. That's a very important thing. But other than that, I would say, call, look on Operation Care website here. <laughs> this is what we're about. Volunteer, you know, bring, see what, what is needed, you know, between the coats, the clothing, uh, uh, the food, everything that's going to be needed to serve 10,000 homeless people in one day. Uh, it's, it's an enormous amount of need. So look there. If, not, if you can't do any of those things, if you're not here locally, then show up at your local mission. Mm -hmm. And I know it's COVID, <laughs> but uh, uh, all of these kind of things are going on. But, you know, just you will be blessed for showing up. And people are taking precautions as well. Uh, so you're not going to be in any more danger being in a homeless shelter than you are going to a grocery store. So just show up and be a blessing to someone. Well, you see, I also became homeless by choice. I went on the street and lived in um, a community of homeless people, about 100 of them at nighttime and that was the most unforgettable but it made me a better person knowing that the homeless people are scared to death at nighttime they you couldn't sleep and uh, i was scared to death but the lord opened my eyes and made me a better person so now i could understand what it is to be homeless in the street living in the street it's so uncertain you are afraid you're scared that somebody will kill you or stab you to death but you know what if God calls you to help the homeless, go ahead and do it. I left my job. I left. I was a supervisor, a nursing supervisor. I left it so I could help the homeless. And it made me a much better person. And I found my purpose. And that is bringing glory to God and helping the homeless. Okay, so this Christmas time, go and help the homeless. Help Operation Care. Go to our website, opcare.org. Volunteer, give, and pray. And when you see a homeless person, as what Ron said, ask their name, give bottled water or food, whatever you have, and uh, pray for them if you can and ask their name. They are not invisible. That's right. You know, and, don't, and don't be afraid to give them a, a, a couple of dollars because, right. or $20 or any, because, you know, you are the one that receives the blessing and it's between them and God what they do with right. the money. 
Yeah. That's so, true. Well, we only have about a minute left. So, you know, I was thinking about this. If Denver were here today uh, and you could tell him how he impacted your life, what would you tell him? Well, I would tell him, first of all, thank you. Because uh, you took me uh, and you completely transformed my outlook on life and the way that I see people and the way I see things. And uh, I just thank you for, for humbling me because I was a very arrogant person and, uh, and I, I could not even uh, imagine me spending any time with someone like that. And all of a sudden, I realized that God had, uh, had it in mind for me to be transformed, to tell a story that could, for other millions of people that are just like me, to be able to uh, understand and see the homeless with his eyes and not with our own eyes. Well, Susie, we always like to end the show with the good Perfect. news, right? The good yes. news. So the good news of the gospel is what we say all the time here is that Christians, believers, we're not perfect people, but we are forgiven people. And the good news of the, of the gospel is that even though we're sinners, we have God's grace. It's a gift. It's given to us freely. It's a gift of grace. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to do anything, but we do have to accept it. And uh, that's why it's good news. When we say, Lord, we need you. Would you come into my life? That's all you have to do. And then, Lord, he takes you right where you are. And um, by the way, you might be watching. Maybe you're, you've been self-centered. And maybe you've sort of knew something that is missing. And you're hearing this story today. Uh, Susie's going to lead us in a quick prayer here. And how simple. You could do this right here, right now, today. By the way, I want you to hear this. There are no man-made limits to God's grace. None. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you know what? God uses imperfect, broken people. But we do have to say yes. We do have to say help. And if that's you today, I want you to pray along with Susie. Uh, by the way, when you do that, you come as you are. But Jesus loves us so much that we don't stay as we are. He takes over from that point. And he gives us eternal life. And he gives us life more abundantly. Not some time down the future, but right here, right now. And if that's you today, I want you to pray with us. Susie? Just remember three things. A, B, C. Accept the Lord as your Lord and Savior. Believe Jesus is the only way. Confess that you are a sinner. A, B, C. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we ask you to come into our hearts. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me of all my sins. Yes. I confess I am a sinner. And please help me to have a life that is in your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's simple. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank That's you, right. Ron. Thank you. And remember, my friend Denver used to say, nobody can help everybody, but everybody, everybody can help, help somebody. somebody. Amen to that. Amen. Okay. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.